Good evening, everybody. Let's have a word of prayer. Gracious Father, thank you for this evening. Thank you for our time this evening. Thank you for your word. The, your word is so powerful and 2,000 years old and yet it yet lives. Something written by the inspiration of your spirit speaks to us today. May your word speak to us tonight. Have your way. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. 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 Turn, to, turn to 1 Corinthians 8. 1 Corinthians 8. We are we're taking a walk through portions of 1 Corinthians and looking at how we as believers can live in this and with this freedom that we have in Jesus Christ. That we are set free in Christ. And now what do we do? How do we live? What do we do with it? Can what what have we what's what's the culture say freedom? How does the culture define freedom? Do whatever I want, however I want, whenever I want, with whomever I want. It just, you know, that's how our culture defines freedom. And, 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 and if you're not careful, when you become a Christian, you begin to think because, and you have, which is, when you have been set free in Christ, you free. And our theme verse from, is from Galatians 5 and 1. It says, for freedom, Christ has set you free. He set you free so that you could be free. So the question becomes, as believers in Christ, if we're going to be honest about this thing, okay, does that mean I can do anything I want? Within reason? Uh, no, Paul gives some great, some, some guidelines on how we're to use this freedom that Christ has given to us. All right? Um, and so the de in Corinth, the structure of Corinth, uh, the, the Corinthians, first Corinthians, it's we know that this is at least a second letter that um, Paul has written to them. It's they, they no, there's a letter writing. There's a correspondence going on between Paul, who wrote this letter and the Corinthian church. We know from another chapter verse that there was another letter that Paul wrote to them. Now we know this much. That this, we don't have that letter. It's not extent as they say. What we do know is that Paul received a letter from the Corinthians. And this particular letter in 1 Corinthians is a response to some questions that they had written to him. There was some division going on in the church, you know, and is that unusual? No. Is there some conflict going on? There's some conflict over over theological questions, over sex questions, over discipline questions, over this several questions or issues that was causing division in this church. And they wrote to him and said and with these questions. Or, or these, these things that he, issues that they had division about, disagreement about, okay? And you can see those when you read through, he'll, he'll introduce it by saying, now as it relates to, now concerning. And anytime you see now concerning, he is saying he's responding to something that they have written to him in a previous letter. OK, we looked at one of those. The first one last week in chapters. Well, week four and chapter six, seven. OK, today we're going to look at another one. They may seem similar. And when I when we, our first our first lesson in this series on Wednesday night and get you we I, I did a summary, so it may seem like we repeating, but I wanted to give you an overall summary of what Paul says, how we ought to operate with our freedom. Chapter seven, verse one. 
now concerning matters about which you wrote. That lets us know that they had written something to, to him in prior prior time. So chapter chapter seven, verse twenty five. Now concerning the patrol. Here's another issue. All right. That he's addressing. Now we get to chapter eight, verse one. Now concerning. All right. That's the pattern. And you'll see that moving forward. There's an issue. He, he wants to address it. Sometimes he quotes them, but they he repeats the question back to them or he repeats the issue back to them or he'll quote them uh, some saying that they have. Um, however, whatever it is, he want he addresses. It. So today we're looking at chapter eight, verse one. And he says, what now concerning? All right. That's the general structure um, of that. And I want to read the entire chapter. It's only 13 verses. So let's let, let's re, let me read chapter eight of first Corinthians. <laughs> now concerning food offered to idols. We know that all of us possess knowledge. This knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. If anyone imagines that he knows something, he does not yet know as he ought to know. If anyone loves God, he is known by God. Verse four. Therefore, as to the eating of food offered to idols, we know that an idol has no real existence and that there is no God but one. For although there may be so-called gods in heaven or on earth, as indeed there are many gods and many lords, yet for us there is one God, the Father from whom, are, from whom are all things and for whom we exist, and one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom are all things and through whom we exist. Verse seven, however, not all possess this knowledge, but some, through former association with idols, eat food as really offered to an idol, and their conscience, being weak, is defiled. Food will not commend us to God. We are no worse off if we do not eat, and no better off if we do. But take care that this right of yours does not somehow become a stumbling block to the weak. For if anyone sees you who have knowledge eating in an idol for if anyone sees you who have knowledge eating in an idol's temple will he not be encouraged if his conscience is weak to eat food offered to idols and so by your knowledge this weak person is destroyed the brother for whom Christ died thus sinning against your brothers and wounding their conscience when it is weak you sin against Christ Therefore, if food makes my brother stumble, I will never eat meat lest I make my brother stumble. OK. That's the that's the general thing. Got some questions on top of your outline. there. Uh -oh. <laughs> what what? Um, and so the main verse is chapter uh, is verse one. Now concerning food off eyes, we know that all of us possess knowledge. This knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. That's the theme for this, this, this tonight's lesson. Knowledge puffs up. So what are, um, what are some gray areas? What's a, first off, what's a gray area? What's your position on political involvement? How, how far should you go in politics? Watch this. A couple of things about me personally. Number one, I hated politics. Anybody who knew me knew. My buddy called me from South Africa and said, Park, you running? What you what? This ain't, he knew me, he know me from high school. We didn't know each other 50 years. Politics dirty. I come from the town, the seat, the, the, the seat of the political universe in this country. I saw the dirt. Grew up in a political family. When I say political family, I mean my parents 
talked at the table. We got newspaper in the morning and in the evening. The Washington Post in the morning, the news in the evening, two papers every day. They were read and discussed. Um, then when I get to seminary, I got a professor who says, they teach that, that if you're a pastor, if you're in the ministry, you, you don't stoop yourself to get into politics. That's what I was taught. You don't stoop yourself as a preacher. You're above that. You're above that. That's for other folks to you. You, can, you influence through the preaching of the gospel. You don't stoop, go down to that level. So, from my experience and my training, that was a no-no. Everything ain't black and white, y'all. There are gray areas. It's everything ain't right, everything ain't wrong. There's a whole bunch that says what? It depends. Now, we really want to make everything black and white, it makes it easy for us. But when we're talking about our freedom in Christ, everything is not black and white. Now, Brother Bowler want to mention Deuteronomy, but also, hey, my I was raised where you don't eat shrimp and catfish. And I come here, I'm used to eating catfish I mean, fish every Friday. My dad owned my dad's buddy. One of my his best buddy owns a fish market. We he went every Friday. He was in town to go buy fresh fish, and my mama cooked it every Friday. There ain't no kid, no nasty catfish. Them bottom feeders. The Bible says Deuteronomy. <laughs> this is a bottom feeder. That Leviticus shrimp got the scale is where. On the outside, what the Bible say about that? Man. So, hey. My, my grandmother cooked, b bought fish. She was a fisherwoman. Fished all day, every day if she could. And she caught catfish. She didn't throw them back. You know what she did? She put them in the deep freeze. And then the other culture would come knock on the back door and say, Miss Maggot, you have some catfish? And she, yeah, I got some. She always had some. They buy it from her. But she didn't eat it. She didn't have us eat it. And we had fish at her house at least three, four times a week. Everything ain't black and white. I love this little <laughs> quote I saw, and I just put it on the screen. I don't know if you can see it. said, Dear Gray Area, why do you have to make everything so messy and complicated? Sincerely, fan of black or white. <laughs> we want everything to be, I'm a fan of black, everybody's a fan of black and white. And we don't like messy and complicated areas, because you know what it does? It forces us to think. It forces us to read the word. It forces us to make decisions that that are in gray areas that depend. And we don't like that. And then we want to make our gray area somebody else black and white for them. And that's where our problem comes in. We want to make an area that's gray black and white for somebody else. And that's our lesson today. Stumbling blocks. Do you have any habit that may cause a stumbling block for a brother? Do you have a habit that may be a stumbling block for your brother or sister? If so, what is it? How have you, how have you handled it in the past? What approach do you take toward things that may fall in a gray area? How far are you willing to avoid being a stumbling block? Watch this, in four different times, verse, verse 7, weak Christian, weak. 
verse 9, weak. Verse 10, weak. Verse 11, weak. What's a weak Christian? Be careful here. Now, this ain't no trick question. But you be careful. You better think for you. What's a weak Christian? Should I eat food sacrificed to idols? Yes. That's, an, that's an example of, of that Paul is dealing with. That's what Paul is dealing with tonight uh, in this text. That's not an issue for us today, okay? But we got a whole lot of stuff. We've, we've raised some of them here this, this evening, all right? That are gray areas that, that you know, could go either way, all right? Here, the, the text says, I mean, the issue is now concerning food offered to idols. The principle is, number one, knowledge, the principle is this, knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. That's what Paul said, verses one through three. All of us possess knowledge. This knowledge, he got it in quotes, puffs up, but love builds up. So that's the principle by which we ought to be exercising our freedom. Not how much we know. We know that you, you can eat catfish. No, love dictates whether I eat the catfish or not in front of my grandmama. Not my knowledge of the fact that the word declares that all foods are clean. I have the knowledge I know what the word says in Deuteronomy, and I know what the word says in Acts, and I know that I, I know that he says whatever food I eat in doesn't, doesn't impact my relationship with God. I know all of that. Knowledge. But that knowledge must be tempered by is that knowledge does not dictate what I do. Knowledge does not dictate alone. Knowledge alone. Knowledge alone does not dictate what I do. What dictates what I do is knowledge that is guided by love. So the overall principle on what I, how I live, how I use my freedom is what I know, my knowledge of the word of God, that is guided by my love for other people. And so even though I know I shouldn't, you know, I can eat catfish and I can eat shrimp and don't nobody eat that more than me. I'm still Friday night fish. <laughs> Cook catfish. Now I had no choice 20 years ago. I had no choice, literally. That just amazes to me. I never had catfish till I came to Texas. Never. Um, didn't know what it tastes like. But watch this. Me eating catfish in front of my, with my grandmother, though I had all this knowledge, would have been arrogant and wrong and divisive. Wrong. And me telling her, Grandma, mm-mm. The word says, no. In that instance, my grandmother was weak. It wasn't about knowledge. It ain't about what you know. I could have informed her and shown her in the word. But if her habit had been and she felt like that that was, that was a wrong thing for a believer, for a Christian to do. It is my job to love my grandmother enough not to do it and allow her the time for her knowledge to catch up with her, beha her behavior and her knowledge to become together, to come together. A weak Christian is not somebody who don't want to do. A weak Christian ain't 
somebody who listens to other people and do what they say. A weak Christian in this context is someone on this example here. Because Paul uses it five, six times here in these, in these four verses. A weak Christian is someone who is a believer. They are Christian. Number two, in this instance, they, are, they were idolaters. They had, come, they had come from, lived in a culture, surrounded by a culture, and came out of a culture where they ate food that was sacrificed to idols. It was a part of, there was no party in Corinth that did not have this going on. There was no, you didn't go to somebody's house and fellowship without this. There were household gods and there were public gods. And you did not go to somebody's house and eat with them, especially if they were not a believer, that they did, that you did not, they, their food was sacrificed to an idol. Shoot, if y'all pray over y'all food, what y'all doing? Y'all giving it to a god. Man, it happens to be the true God, the real God. You asking the real God to bless your food. So watch this. So it ain't crazy. This ain't no crazy behavior. This ain't, but their gods, they sac it was a sacrifice to them. And Paul says, their behavior, if you, if you eat and you know better, you know, and you go ahead and eat in front of that person, you are sinning against Christ when you know that they, it may lead them to sin. And in that context, context, they're weak. And they, that's not a problem. That's not something against them. That is something that they have to grow. It's an area in which they have to grow. And we need to be careful on how we judge, how we articulate what a weak Christian in, in this stuff is. So if you know better, so what dictates your freedom is not, I know, I know what the word says. I know I can do this. I know I can do that. And you ought to be free to do it. And if you ain't, you are, let that go. That's old stuff. You ain't right. You ain't got to deal with that. You're free. Well, they're not there yet. They're not there yet. And we have a responsibility as believers in Christ to build up our brother and sister. Not to use our knowledge against, not just against them, but not to denigrate them or hinder them or as the text says, defile in verse seven and destroy ooh, in verse 11. We sin against Christ. You can't get no stronger than that, y'all. So issue is, the, what's the issue? The issue is, um, the issue is Roman numeral two down, the eating food sacrifice to idols. What does verse? four through six say, we know. Therefore, as e we know what? That an idol is what? It's nothing. It's not real. We know that. There is no God but one. Verse five, and although there may be so-called gods in heaven and earth, and people got gods. We got gods today. I did not. I didn't fully understand how rich a nation we were till I went and lived in Kenya, East Africa for two years and lived in a mud hut and used the outhouse and took a shower outside and lived with cow dung floor and all of that. I did. And my my salary was eighty dollars a month and I made more 
than three quarters of the people in the country. I did not, to your very point, I really didn't understand how rich this country is. Even the, almost the poorest person here is rich in so many other countries. The, and so we, we, we make idols out of everything. Churches are idol, the cowboys are an idol, our jobs are an idol, all of that. All of that. We make, we, any, and an idol by definition is anything you put before God. Anything or anybody you place before God. And how do you know if you place something before God? What controls you? What dictates you? What determines your behavior? How do you spend your time and your money? Jesus says it clearly. Where your money is, that's where your heart is. So if you put your money in your house and your cars and everything else and you ain't got no money for the Lord, then you know what? You putting something before God. It's an idol. That's your God. It's the system. <clears throat> so it's easy to look 2,000 years ago and say these people are doing so and so and they did so and so and so. And, and mm -mm, mm -mm, mm -mm. I think we worse off. To be honest, I think we worse off because you know what? Their gods were visible and physical. They built statues and, and went to the temple and did all that stuff. But our gods, our idols, and you can't see them. You can't see them. And so our job is to, so knowledge, so knowledge says what? Knowledge says what? So that's the basic principle in, in verses one through three. And then verses four through six gives us the principle. Knowledge says, no problem, eat whatever you want. Because what? Idols are nothing. There's only one God, the Father, because there's only one Lord, Jesus Christ. All right? Go ahead and eat. You're free. That's what knowledge says. Verse six, yet yeah, for us there is one God. The Father, from whom all thi are all things and for whom we exist, and one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom are all things and through whom we exist. And so that's the principle. That's, that's the principle. That's what knowledge says. That means you're free to do it. We know that, my, that food don't mean nothing. Don't do nothing for you. But love says, in verse, starting in verse 7, love says, however... Here we go into the gray area. However, not all possess this knowledge. But some, through former association with idols, eat food. Watch this. Eat food as really offered to an idol. See, this is why you can't take it home, Sister Seller. Y'all sitting in the house. <laughs> You sitting in the you sitting at the dinner table, you at the feast, and 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 you sitting in somebody's house. They've sacrificed it to an idol. They prayed over it. Okay? And that has been their habit. That has been their lifestyle. And and they know what that other person is doing. They know that they, they know they're Christian now because we talking about Christians. We talking about weak Christian. All right. We're not talking about unbelievers. Weak Christian recognizes that that that. Yeah, I used to do that. I used to be there. I was that person. And I know what they doing. And I can't do that. So you sitting up and saying, are you free to do that? You, you, you ain't got to No, you're wrong, because if they eat that. As, as the text says, they eat it's food, they, eat, they would be eaten as it's really offered to a real idol. They just came out of that. They ain't there yet. And so love says, don't do it. Love says, limit my freedom in order to build up my brother. Give him some time. Give her some time. 
Give them the knowledge, but yet let that knowledge reach their behavior, their heart. And in the meantime, you don't do it. How much <laughs> I don't know. It depends. It depends. Um, we're not we're not to let their weakness dictate. OK, someone else's weakness does not dictate my behavior. They they we can't just let them rule. OK. Um, so there's a, there's a there's a there's a balance there. Um, but it depends. I asked the question years ago to this church and leadership meetings over and over again. There's some acceptable sins and there's some unacceptable sins in this church and every church. And adultery was an acceptable sin. And fornication. We didn't get all. Hey, no, we just tell people that they wrong and you ought not be doing it. And we still fellowship with them. But homosexuality is an acceptable scene because if we think somebody's homosexual if that's their problem then all of a sudden <laughs> and we, we shun them and it's the same sin it's the same sin it's unacceptable sin to us and so my question has always been those of who who heard me ask this question well pastor well they asked well, well how long they get saved. Say they get saved. Homosexual get saved, but they still in a homosexual relationship. How much time you going to give them? You going to give them as much time as the, the, the adulterer or the fornicator is? And just think about it on a practical level. No, you ain't. Because those of you who are not homosexual understand the person who's fornicating and adulterating. Because you say, except for the grace of God, there go you. But the homosexual, you can't get with that. I, ain't, I can't understand no man with no man and no woman with no woman. And so, and so, our patience because salvation don't change your behavior overnight. You each know that. Some, all of us in here got some stuff we ain't supposed to be doing. Speeding down the tollway trying to get to the church. Yeah, yeah. So I don't have an answer to that question, Sister Wilson. It is as individual according to the situation. My job is to say to that adulterer and that fornicator and that one who's engaged in a homosexual relationship, you know you can need to get out of that. What do I need to do? This is what you need to do, and I'm willing to walk with you. You need to end that relationship. But I've been in a relationship, I've been in that relationship for 10, 15 years. How am I going to end that? I don't know, but the Lord has given you freedom to do it. Whereas before Christ, you didn't have the freedom to do it. You were in bondage to your sin. But you're free now, and you can let that go. You can do it. And I'm going to walk with you. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. How long? And how far? And it's as individual as the person that you are. You, you the strong Christian. It's as individual as that situation. Is at some point you say, you, have, you might have to say, you know what? It seems like you don't have a desire to end this over here. You know what? Now that's a problem. I don't know if I can go with you. Because now you're making a decision willfully 
and continuously. It don't mean you don't relapse every now and then, but your intent seems to be to remain in this, have your relationship with God and dishonor him in this area of your life. You can't keep doing that. And, and I, go for it, it, no, that goes for anything. That's not what I'm saying, but you, and you wouldn't keep trying to disciple if they decided, made a decision to get married to the person you're in a relationship with. They've, they've walked away from the discipleship relationship. I'm going to try to keep a relationship. Because one thing I've learned, Sister Wilson, I'm old now, and I'm glad about it. I've seen too many people change. I've had too many people come back to me and say, you know what, Pastor, you were right. I've had too many people come, whether they said it to me or not. I didn't live long enough to see change. And I never know when it's going to happen. If it's going to happen or how it's going to happen. So my job is to maintain some kind of relationship, some kind of openness. And I've discovered, because folks say I'm hard um, or I'm direct or whatever, but I keep, I try, I do my best to keep the uh, relationship open. Now, if they choose not to, they walk away, that's on them. But I'm here. I'm going to be here. And you just know where I stand. Love you, but I can't, can't go with you there. Can't go that far with you. But, so, every situation's different. So that's, that's my general principle. Say what the truth is. Walk with them as far as I can. But after a while, if you stop listening and you're not receiving it, or I'm a pro I become a problem, because there's times when I become a problem, you won't hear from me no more. So you know what? I love you, but you, I, if, I'm the, if I'm a stumbling block to you, because everybody don't agree, I mean, you gotta you can take my personality, everybody can't take the, my directness, or everybody can't take the truth that I see. And sometimes I see the truth so far advanced and they ain't nowhere there, and, they, and I'm telling them what the truth is, and they can't see it. Well, okay, it ain't for me. You need to hear it from somebody else. So I kind of, I back off. Say, you know, you got to figure out how to do it with your personality and by the Spirit, as the Spirit directs you in how to exercise your freedom. And watch this, and never take away somebody else's freedom because they still had a freedom to choose. And so, I can't take away, I'll just tell you what it is. This is what it is. Now, you choose to do with it what, what you want. Our challenge is, as believers, is to maintain the relationship when somebody has turned away. That's where we struggle. That's where we struggle. Ah, uh, love says limit my freedom because not everyone can accept the right doctrine. Two, because some of us are weak. We've talked about that. Because my freedom can become a stumbling block to others. Ah, I just mentioned stumbling block. How? By his weak conscience. His conscience, weak conscience, it becomes the problem. For if anyone sees you who have knowledge eating in an idol's temple, will he not be encouraged if his conscience is weak to eat food offered to idols? If he sees you do it, won't you? Won't you think because this conscience is weak and you know that, that you may encourage him to eat that food, do that thing? So you, you become a stumbling block. Not that person, that weak Christian is not the problem. You're the problem. Two, by my freedom. So it's by his conscience can become, I can become a stumbling by, and then my freedom. He fails, he falls into ruin or is destroyed. My, by my freedom, he falls into. Verse 11, what it say? And so by your knowledge, this weak person is destroyed. 
than the brother for whom Christ died. You the problem. Turn over. Because Christ died for my brother, therefore I can limit my freedom. When lastly, because I may sin against my brother, wound his conscience, and sin against Christ. What's the principle? Knowledge that is guided by love. I, what do I do? Now that I'm free, what do I do? I take this knowledge. I don't think I got. So I, I've been having this little chart every week. Maybe we get it. I want to add something to it. I would probably change something to it. Go down there. It says, all right, do, how, does the Bible allow it? If no, then don't do it. Does my conscience allow it? No, then don't do it. If I would add something there, and it's covered then. it. Does my brother's conscience allow it? If no, don't do it. And that's with anything. Then he goes, I should I exercise my freedom? Yeah. Will it have a bad effect on other believers? Will it have a bad effect on non-believers? Will it have a bad effect on my Christian growth? So, any questions, comments, thoughts? It ain't, it ain't, it ain't all that easy, is it? But I, I, I'm, from my personal experience, I know the, I, the, the Lord, the Spirit of God will direct you. He will. The Spirit of God will show you when and how to, to, when to say, okay, that's enough. When to say, you know what? Come on, let's go. What does Jesus do? Jesus hangs out with drunkards and prostitutes. He hangs out with them. He goes to the party with them. He hangs out with them often enough that he's accused of what? Being a drunkard. Are you willing? Are you willing to be accused of being a drunk? And whatever other word you want to put to it. Because of your fellowship or relationship with somebody who's a drunk? Are you willing to be considered homosexual? If you are in relationship with someone who is a homosexual, saved or unsaved, he was hanging out with folk that were not saved. Exactly. What was his goal? And if my goal in hanging out with the unacceptable sin, the unacceptable sinners, we all right with hanging out with the acceptable sinners. We ain't got no problem. But the unacceptable sinners, we got issues. And then we ask the question, how long? Come on, we guilty. We guilty. And Jesus says, it's, it's the elder, elder Lee's point, what's the goal? And if the goal is to see this brother and sister set free from whatever is binding them, how long he been hanging out with you? How long he done put up with you? How long he done tolerated your the stuff you still got going on. What do we do all with our freedom? I'm free to do whatever. Now I'm, I'm free now what? I, I got this knowledge and I'm supposed to use it to build my brother, sister up. And whatever it takes to do that, that's what I'm supposed to do. And we'd be willing to pay the cost that's associated with it. Paul got accused of being a hypocrite because he had, it could depend. He says it depends. Well, you don't stand for nothing. You ain't got no principles. 
That's what they accused him of in 1 Corinthians. Second, you said you were coming. He didn't come. Well, we can't believe you. We take you to your word. Well, I don't, they don't care that you got delayed. They don't know what the Lord told him. No, we ain't telling you. You ain't supposed to go. Well, you ain't. We can't listen to you because you, you said you were coming. You didn't show up. Man, we got all kinds of reasons. All right. Good time. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you for this night. Thank you for the gray areas. Thank you that you give us your spirit to guide us in these gray areas. May we learn to trust your spirit working in us and through us to glorify your name with the freedom that you've given to us. And may we set other people free in the process. Thank you for what you've done. Thank you for your word. Thank you for the clarity of your word. And thank you for the freedom in your word that you've given us as believers in Christ. Give us traveling grace from this place. Pray we find all things well. Meet us here, Lord, uh, Sunday as we proclaim and praise you. Thank you for each one that's here tonight, each one that will join in. In Christ's name I pray, amen. 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 God bless you. Amen. Have a good evening. You free! Well, now what you gonna do with it?